Welcome everyone to the C-Suite Marketing Perspectives podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. And today we're going to have a conversation that I guarantee you is going to give you a different perspective than you've had before around the world of being a data-driven CMO. What does that mean? And to add a little healthy dose of controversy here, Mark's point of view is that most CMOs are doing data wrong. And when you talk about being data-driven and how important that is, we all wear that as a badge of honor. So this is a really important conversation. Now, Mark, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, but you are a former CMO at a large enterprise organization. Yep. Yep. You are now the CEO of a software analytics company. You work with other CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, CROs, and you can talk all those different languages. But most importantly, you're on top of an analytic company. Tell us a little bit more about your background and then what you're doing at Proof Analytics before we jump in here. So my background is, in many ways, uh, I was a, a, a marketer and a communicator like so many other marketers and communicators. And it was only beginning about 20 years ago that I started really getting into analytics in a fairly deep way, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then I, over the years, have synergized all of the learnings that I had as a normal marketer with what I have seen repeated over and over again in Uh, causal analytics. And so today I try to marry empathy and understanding as a marketer, right? With a very factual set of commentary, right? About marketing and what, what the analytics tell us and the analytics don't tell us everything. And it is a probabilistic exercise because we live in a probabilistic world. There's a, there's determinism, right? Laws of gravity. You drop a million rocks off of a building and not one of them is going to be floating in, in the air at the end of it, not having hit the ground, right? They're all going to hit the ground. So that is determinism and that exists in the physical space. But as soon as you get into human performance, endeavor, action, right? It's all deterministic. We all have free will. We all do crazy shit on a regular basis. And so really it comes down to making, refining the odds to where you have the best chance of success. And that's really where we are today. The pressure that expensive cash and hard to get cash has brought to the C-suite is rippling down through all the functions, not just marketing, not just go to market and putting a a lot of stuff under a microscope. There's a a feeling and it's not without basis on my net, um, that today, both the cost of capital, cost of cash and the opportunity cost on that cash is so high that you cannot really afford to be substantially wrong anymore. And so much scary business cases are coming back with a vengeance, FP and A teams as financial planning and analysis teams and within finance are exploding in size and power. And a lot of these things I don't think are going to ever revert, right? This, these, a lot of these things are not going to be temporary expedient moves. They're going to gain depth and power and traction. And will either be good or uh, in most cases, or occasionally not so good in some cases, right? If you, could you ground us? And one of the premises here is that most CMOs, data-driven CMOs, are, are, we're doing it wrong, right? Can you give us your perspective on what a data-driven CMO, what that means? And what's the direction, what's the projection that we need to be taking to, in order to do things right? Let's just get it settled right from the beginning. I think that you have to, I have, I think you have to say up front that the phrase data-driven is wonderful alliteration. It flows off the tongue. It, if for a long time, it was a signal that you were somebody different and special. The problem is is that it actually is wrong. 
to be data driven. So number one, data is always and only about the past. And what all of us have to be concerned with is the future. And to what extent is the past like the future, predictive of the future? And so if you are data driven, it is, uh, and I'm not the first person to ever say this, so it's not like my, my cute little statement here, but it's like driving your car at 80 miles an hour on the freeway, looking only in the rearview mirror. Okay. And you are guaranteed to crash. Okay. Probably won't even take that long uh, for you to crash. A better analogy sticking with navigation, transportation, all that kind of stuff is you need to be running a GPS, right? So you think about the GPS on your phone, right? It says, Hey, this is where I am right now. And you tell it, this is where I need to go. And it gives you three routes to choose from. These three routes, by the way, are literally forecasts. It's had, even though the routes themselves haven't really changed the concrete that was poured three years ago is still there and all that nothing's really changed what's going on circumstantially in those roots can change instantly there's an accident all of a sudden there's a lot of traffic whatever right and so what that means is that the route that was a really good route suddenly can become not even remotely the best route. And so what does that do? That means you have to reroute, right? Your GPS says, Hey, Steve, dude. Okay. If you stay on this route, which was really good, but isn't anymore. If you stay here, you're going to be an hour late to your meeting. But if you go right up here and then go left and right and left. Okay. You'll only be eight minutes late. And we can show this in terms of the way that all of these factors interact with each other to produce this outcome that is causal AI. That is a modern, highly automated, highly interpretive, highly sophisticated form of math that has been around for a very long time called regression. And it, that's really what it is. And. My final little capstone on this, okay, is that this is something that B2C marketers have been using heavily for 40 or 50 years, big CPG, big retail, big hotel and hospitality, all those guys are heavy users of exactly this kind of stuff. Why it has never until just recently broken into B2B is a product of a lot of misinformation and a lot of people who honestly don't know what they're talking about a lot of times. And so I totally understand that. I personally have been one of those people who did not know what the hell he was talking about any number of subjects, right? But. I try really hard. This is really important to get it right. Finally, marketing is a great profession that delivers phenomenal value. It's a phenomenal multiplier of business performance. It should not, it should be one of the last professions to have descended into a meme among, in business circles, a negative meme in business circles. And to the extent that we can help change that fact and make being a marketer something to be proud of, again, for other people to be proud that you are a marketer, right? That's a great goal, man. That's a goal that I want to be a part of. What this makes me think about is in the world of B2B, there's all kinds of forecasts that are done on a regular basis. Sales constantly forecasts, right? That's one of the number one things that they do because that's the predictor of revenue and therefore investment that the company can be making, the allocation of budgets and things like that based on what we think revenue this quarter, this next quarter is coming. It usually comes down to a lot of the time, individual salespeople putting a percent on their, their revenue forecast in terms of- Oh yeah, that's extrapolation most of the time. Yeah, it's not absolutely. extrapolation.
there's two questions I have that I've just been dying to ask. One is explain your methodology you've done. And I can't remember, tell us how many interviews you've done and with who on top of the analytics that you provide. And what does that do? What does that allow us as marketers then to do? So I think that the analytics and the interviews I've done for the book are connected in some way, right? But they are really two different things that are complementary one to the other, right? The analytics is really, if you want to understand causality, if you want to be able to say, okay, this is our forecasted impact of all these investments out in, across multiple time scales, right? And then adjust that repeatedly as the external factors in the marketplace change and optimize your spend based on real life odds. It's like, a, it's, this is really, if you gamble on sports, okay, this is a really serious heavyweight, high gravitas version of being a bookie, right? What are the odds, right? That's really what that is, right? And so what the bar that has been set historically by marketing and indeed by go-to-market overall on this has been exceptionally low. They really haven't been able to do any of this. They have not been able to say, hey, if you spend this in marketing, it will generate that kind of impact, that kind of value. And you'll have to, you'll have to wait maybe six months for that to materialize. But when it materializes, it'll be huge and boom and all that kind of stuff. They've been completely unable and be to do that. Not because the math doesn't, it hasn't existed forever. Okay. It took, put a fine point on it, sadly, right? One part of an algorithm in regression today was written by Aristotle. Okay. So this is not exactly new. It has gotten significantly more sophisticated and particularly with the advent or the inclusion of artificial intelligence of different types, right? It has really gotten a lot more sophisticated, but this is not new. So there is all of that to it. And then as part of my book, I decided to write a book on why are, are, is the C-suite so completely pissed off at marketing and at go to market more broadly. And so the, the only way to really do that is to say, Hey, I'm going to go talk to a lot of CEOs and CFOs. In this case, we did it in the fortune 1000 kind of company context. And we sat down for a couple hours or so with quite a lot of them. And over the last year, and we said, Hey, you know what? Here's some questions. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you're feeling. And all these questions were done on background. All these interviews were done on background because not a one of them, quite understandably, wanted to go on the record and have to deal with all the fallout, right? It just wasn't worth it to them. Okay. But if we did it on background, they were more than willing to be radically candid without saying that I agree with everything that I heard to the don't, right? It was, ex I think that right now, as of this time and this place, I probably know more about the mindset of Fortune 1000 CEOs and CFOs as it applies to go to market than anybody else. Because I have so done. You probably know then and have a very big opinion on why CMOs have the shortest tenure in the C-suite. And when you, I wrote it down as you were saying why the CC is so pissed off at marketing, right? You have an opinion about that based on all of these interviews that if you would share, why is the tenure so short and what can CMOs do about it? So I think the part of it is that they don't see any indication from marketing teams, particularly in B2B, that, that they're doing anything to be able to prove anything. 
about the money that they're spending. And they're very concerned about the fact that the stuff that marketers would say they've been doing to try and get to that reveals a level of not understanding the realities that business people find pretty scary. Like the whole idea of touch-based attribution as a statistically viable means for optimizing marketing spend and for proving impact on the sales process. If you're a CMO and you have presented those kinds of perspectives and you've gotten kind of silence or you've gotten argument, but you've just gotten a certain incredulity and nobody is actually making any business decisions based on those presentations, that should tell you something like a lot of them. I've lost track of how many of these guys that I've interviewed, most of them I'm very unfortunately are still men. They are just blown away by what passes for logic in go to market, not just sales or not just marketing, but sales, right? It's a, they're actually just as pissed at sales, they're just as angry at sales as they are at marketing. And if you look at CRO tenure, it's not much better than the average CMO. No, it's not. It's right know? behind, right behind. Right behind. Yeah. One CEO, we were talking about confidence and trust at this point in the interview. And he goes, yeah, he goes, okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about the CMO and the CRO in the light of confidence and trust. Keeping in mind, this is a very, the CEO of a very large company. Okay. He said, okay, so CMO, lots of trust. I believe that we're not going to have any, the way he put it was, we're not going to have any beer company scandals in our company. Clearly referring to Bud Light, right? Yeah. Yeah. But he's, I don't have any confidence that the marketing team knows why they do what they do and can change it appropriately as the marketplace changes. And I'm like, okay. And I said, okay, so what about your CRO? He goes, oh, he goes, that's even worse. Because he goes, I, he goes, I had total confidence that he will make his number and I have absolutely no trust in how he will do it. And well, I let said, me ask you right so, in the middle of this. When I talk to a lot of CMOs on this podcast, I've talked to and interviewed probably 50 to 60 CMOs just this year alone. And they all say I'm a data-driven CMO and they have a badge of honor that they wear for that. And when you ask questions about it, it's all about marketing attribution, right? And you look at our closed deals and deals close at twice the rate when they have five or more marketing touches, right? So they're looking at that marketing attribution and then they're looking at their most successful, most efficient deals that have gone through the process, the EBM process. And they're making those conclusions. But what you're saying is that's just part of the equation, right? Yeah. Look, it's not that customer journey data doesn't matter. It matters a lot. It has very high value. Okay. But there are a lot of things that it isn't and attribution is one of them. Okay. So we can just start. This is not Mark's opinion. This is just a fact. Okay. Attribution and causality are inseparable from each other. If you can't show direct causality, you don't get to claim attribution. You just don't. So we can just start there, right? And we can move on from there. But it is, it's just a, there's a lot of words that get slung around in go to market circles. Okay. That. I was in a meeting three weeks ago. I actually wrote about it on LinkedIn, right? If you want to read the post, this person, not on our team, it was a internal team and, and a very senior business leader was chairing this meeting and I was in there and this person was slinging business jargon around in ways that communicated that maybe this person didn't really entirely understand the words that they were using. And finally, the business leader called him out on it. 
right there in front of everybody. So tell me what this word means. It means, blah, blah, blah. no, that's not what it means. Tell me what this word means. I'm not maybe totally sure, but I'm, I think it means this. No, actually it doesn't mean that at all. Right. And they are tired of the, I'm just speak honestly, they're tired of being bullshitted, right? There's a lot of people who have learned to speak the jargon. There's a lot of, there's a lot of CMOs and a lot of CROs, right? Who have learned to talk about and make it sound like they do all this measurement, all this analytics, and they have never done it ever. I know because I'm there. I was in a meeting. This is right before COVID in New York. CFO invites herself to the meeting at the last minute. I'm on one side of the table. Marketing leadership team is on the other side of the table. CFO's at the head. I go, I'm doing my thing. The marketing team basically in the nicest possible way. And I really mean that very sincerely in the nicest possible way was just deflecting me all over the place, right? And I was getting ready to answer this question and all of a sudden the CFO, who I don't think is a person that you trifle with, raised her hand towards me as if to say, shut up. So I shut up. And then she looked at the, the marketers and said, do you even believe in what you do for a living? And I was just like, okay, that's it. That's the end of the meeting right there, man. This is, you want to talk about the ultimate conversation killer. <laughs> when you say that and I, and it was tough. It was, it was not a pleasant next five minutes. And I left and I just, and I thought to myself, okay, that one's not going to Pan out. Six months later, all of a sudden I get a call. I'd almost totally forgotten about it actually. And the CFO said, Hey, I think we're ready to go now. And I said, okay, I guess my next step is to talk to fill in the blank, the C CMO. And she goes, no, they're all gone. And marketing reports to me for the next year, not because I know anything about marketing and not because I'm going to try to know anything about marketing and tell them how to market, but we are going to give them a clear understanding of the business and what is required to keep score, right? Going forward. And she said, you guys are going to hopefully help us do that. And I said, that sounds great. Let's do that. And, but that is, that's very much where it all is right now. Uh, a lot of CEOs and CFOs that I've spoken to who are very upset. More and more of them have enough honesty to say, among other things, I'm really upset with myself that I didn't take the necessary steps to collaborate with my CMO and my CRO ages ago. And rectify this whole problem. They are more and more aware of the fact that, hey, positional power means they own it. If there's dysfunction in the relationship, they own it. They don't own all of it, but they own a lot of it. So there is, the book is actually going to be very interesting from, from the standpoint that it's that it's really, it's setting forth the terms of a, of the next thousand days which is really going to be a go-to-market revolution. And it, and I really mean that kind of like in a classic political or historical sense, okay? Which means that there's going to be a lot of it that's not going to be very much fun. There's going to be a lot of excesses that have to be walked back later. There's going to be people who are really very unfortunately hurt that shouldn't be hurt. There's also going to be a lot of accountability. There's, if you want to extend it forward, is there going to be a Robespierre, like in the French Revolution? Is there going to be a guillotine? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that stuff because there's going to be a, and people are dead serious right now because they feel the knife at their own throat in a way that two, three, four years ago, they didn't sense at all. 
Yeah, I think it's, I think 2024 and 2025 are going to be strenuous years. Who put an exclamation point on this and wrap this discussion up with a recommendation for CMOs who are all, I'm sure, doing the same thing that I am, which is absolutely getting cash these days, getting investments these days, making the most out of it, especially with the cost of all of that cash, right? The success and the economics that we have right now is more difficult than a lot of us have, have known in a long time. So we understand, right? Because we're, we're hopefully pretty intelligent people, but what is your recommendation of if we want to start to be a better business partner. We want to start being data-driven in terms of forecasting, predicting, using the knowledge that is out there and available. Where do we start? How do we do that? That's a big question. It, it starts with what our friends in recruiting refer to as T-shaped talent, right? If you're a senior marketer, the last thing that you need to spend a lot of time on is further deepening your understanding of marketing. You need to spend the time learning business acumen. You need to learn basic finance conversations. You need to learn analytics, certainly well enough to collaborate with people who do it for a living, right? You need to learn all of that kind of stuff up to and including you need to be able to differentiate clearly between that which is total bullshit, okay, and that which is true and factually based. And so I, I think that it's very clear today that your ability to use analytics to say, what, if you invest this money, this is what it's probably going to get you based on the, these assumptions, and it's okay to have certain assumptions, particularly about the external world, the marketplace, and then be able to model it on an ongoing basis. And when things change out there over which you have no control and all of a sudden stuff that you were doing isn't as effective, you can make changes that either regain effectiveness or you just say, you know what, that's not effective at all anymore. We're just not going to do that for right now. We're going to switch that money over here. I think that you have to really say, I am running a go-to-market portfolio of investments and not just say it, but actually do it. And if you make that commitment, the math, the analytics falls out the back of it because it's the key enabler on the whole thing. The number one way that a lot of CFOs are differentiating who's telling them the truth and who's not is show me the analytics. And if the analytics aren't there to be shown, then it's not real. And I don't think that any of us wants to be caught in that particular problem, right? I think that the other thing that, that if you're uh, in marketing and sales and stuff like that, that you have to grasp the nettle on, yeah, it's very unpleasant. Okay. Is that fair or not, you're not seen today as highly credible. And so there's going to be a, a time period during which you're going to have to re-earn that credibility. That's not fun. No one wants to be there. Okay. And I don't point this out with any particular joy in my heart either. Okay. But I do think, and it works the other way too, by the way, there's nothing perfect about CEOs and CFOs. Okay. Everybody's got work to do in this area, but the reality is, and this may be unfair, but it's super easy to tag marketing and sales with a lot of this stuff. Just the, to give you an idea of what I really mean, in a, it's a meme among CFOs, right? That their marketing teams will go over budget. 
and they won't know that they're going over budget until the very last moment when it's really too late. And many of them, because you think about the kinds of people who go into finance, okay? Getting that something that basic is like breathing to them. So when someone doesn't do it, they don't even know like how to interpret that, okay? And so what do they do? particularly when it keeps happening again and again, they ascribe it to moral failing in the marketing culture, which is a really, woo, you stop and think about that for a second, what that does to your reputation, what it does, the way that they hear everything that you say, whether it's about your budget or not, that is tough. That's really tough. And so I think we have to, acknowledge that again, some of it could be very unfair, but we have to acknowledge it. We have to say, okay, how are we going to fix that and have that never be that way ever again? And, and so that's really the answer. I think overall is ultimately you have to be a business leader who happens to specialize in marketing rather than a marketer. There's one last thing that I want to it was something that we talked about before, and it was the time lag on causality for the programs that we see most put together and how that doesn't work in our favor as well in terms of the tenure and the expectations internally about a return on investment for what we're doing. Oh, it's actually a huge problem. It's a huge, it's Again, this is keynoted the marketing segment of South by Southwest probably two years before COVID. And the presentation was the CMO's greatest enemy was the title of it. And it was all about time lag. And it more specifically, it was a report out of a project that we had done where we had a third group had brought together five companies that had just fired their CMOs and using a common basket of data, they wanted us to run analytics and find out whether the, the firings were justified or not. Four out of the five were not justified. And so the logical question was well, what the hell happened? By the time these CMOs did their listening tour when they first joined and then they revamped the brand or the website or both, they had used up a lot of their runway. And so when they've started really launching, let's call it program investments earnestly, it looked like nothing was happening because of time lag. Everything in B2B in particular is time lagged. It can vary all over the place and to anywhere from say, Two months to 18 months of time lag depends on what it is, what we're talking about, what the business is and all that kind of stuff. But in this particular case, what we found was right about the time that these CMOs were being terminated, their first investments really started to pay off, but nobody understood it that way. No one saw it that way. There was no att attribution of it that way. Not just the business, but the marketing team didn't say, know it either. Now, one of the things that was interesting about this, we all live in the, we're surrounded by the law of unintended consequences. Okay. So one of the CMOs in question got a hold of the report and used it to win a really substantial settlement against her former employer for wrongful termination. Hmm. which I thought was actually cool, right? Because it made the point and it also let it, it, she did a good job. She was doing her job. It's just that nobody, including her, knew how long, no one knew the expectations that needed to be set with the business. And that's what bit them all, right? So time lag in B2B is so significant, actually, that the way the, the 
the business value creation of marketing and sales in B2B is actually asynchronous in time and space. Okay. So that means that Q2 marketing performance and Q2 sales performance usually have nothing in common. Q2 sales performance might have something really in common statistically with the previous Q3 marketing performance. So there's this lag that's very real. Now, why it's so important, it's always been important, but why it's really important today is that to a business team, stuff that takes a long time to pay off feels a lot riskier. But actually, not doing it most of the time is even riskier. So this is where the, the ability to, to show them multiple scenarios and the cost of not investing versus the value of investing and turning the entire thing into a business conversation, not a marketing conversation is so important. It's just absolutely crucial. Mark, again, I, I believe that we had another hour that we could go another hour and be fascinating. <laughs> what is the name of your book? We get it out there. And when is it coming out? All we have is a working title right now. It's called GTM Revolution, but I doubt very seriously if that's going to be the title of the book when it comes out. The, I would say right now, the goal is to get it out right before the summer of 2024 so that it's, I guess will be poolside reading. It is a, sh a relatively short book. It's meant to be read. It's going to be about 150, 160 pages. It may have a sequel at some point, but it is the last thing I wanted to do was 450 page tome, right? That is almost like my gravestone. That's just not, it's not what I'm about at all. If it's not helping people, then it's worthless. And so I, so that's why we made that call. I will tell you this for nothing. And that is, it's a lot harder to write a short book than a long book. Oh, it's a Mark Twain quote. quote. I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. Right. I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. Mark, I just want to say thank you so much. If people wanted to have an opportunity to ask questions, would sending them a link to your profile on LinkedIn be a good idea? Yeah, I'm actually very active on LinkedIn. I post almost every day and I'm active in supporting other people's threads and commenting and all that kind of stuff. Actually, I, I enjoy that more than posting in my own channel. So yeah, it's, I'm really easy to get a hold of there. I'm not particularly an email guy. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that. I would suggest just sending me a, a PM through LinkedIn. Mark, thank you very much for coming on and sharing it. Very eye-opening, but good for all of us to know. I appreciate you coming on to the show. Hey, it's my pleasure.